Well, if you drove past the church uh, Friday or Saturday, <clears throat> you saw that this was a happening place. Uh, first thing I saw was a big piece of plastic going down the hill out there by the thing with kids sliding down. And I said, man, that looks fun. I'd kill myself, but I'll try. <laughs> and there were kids throwing tomahawks and no one was injured or killed, right? That's what I understand. That in itself is amazing. But as I understand how this is set up and the safety things that are put in place, uh, uh, it, it was just a wonderful time and kids were ministered to and adults were ministered to as Kicking Bear Ministries came to Walnut Hill and out to Nathan's house and, uh, and uh, brought Christ into the lives of young people. And uh, we are very uh, honored this morning to have Ray Howell and his wife here this morning. And we've asked Ray to speak to us. It's not often that we get men of this stature. The thing I love about men of his stature is he doesn't really seem to understand what kind of stature he has. He's a humble man, and I love that. I said, how do you want me to introduce you? And he puts his head down and says, just tell him that I love Jesus. I said, that's good. I like that. Uh, but if you try to get a hold of Ray, he's on the road someplace, either in Texas or Maine or Missouri or someplace around the United States where they are putting on camps for kids uh, to draw them close to the heart of Christ and to introduce them to Jesus Christ in hopes that they will give their lives to Christ. So Ray, if you would please come now and share with us uh, your story and uh, lift our hearts to Christ together today, would you please? We, I want you to notice the contrast. <laughs> this is what we're going for this morning. I think this is the first time I've been in the church without wearing a tie in a long time. <laughs> I, uh, Nathan says, just put what you wear to kicking bear on there. Uh, I, did put, I did leave sleeves on my shirts this time. <laughs> I want to tell you uh, what an awesome, awesome, awesome event. My wife and I do Bible studies and study a lot on our brother Paul and all the things he went through since the scales were dropped from his eyes, snake bit, shipwreck, all the things that go on. But what a unbelievable blessing it must have been from him to be able to travel from one area to the next to be with a group of believers who love the Lord. I mean, it must have been just pure joy. I'm standing here today with tears in my eyes and I haven't even had a chance to start talking. I am so blessed. I met so many wonderful people and they were here for the same purpose, to do the Lord's work. I, uh, I had no idea when I was a boy the troubles that I was going through that the result of it was what the Lord had for me. And uh, <clears throat> so, excuse me, uh, standing here today, I'm an ambassador to Christ. and. That is the greatest pro staff I will ever be on. I found that in our jobs and the things that we do, those are really our, our ministries that God has given us. And some of the callings are so revealed and so open to us that we can see them and others uh, wait until that calling is revealed to them. But in reality, our whole life is that calling and sharing the light of Christ. When I was a boy, uh, I had the greatest dad and the most incredible mom in the world. My mom was wonderful. I was about five years old was when I had my best memories. And we had windows in front of the house there that you could stand and look out the window. And every day we waited for dad to come home. And when he came home, it was a riot. I mean, he walked through that door and we tripped him and we tackled him and he threw us around and we had a blast with dad. And my mom was wonderful. She was always upbeat, and, and we were always doing things with her during the day. But when Dad came home, that was special. It was game on. And you know, uh, 
I remember just standing right there, my brothers and sisters alongside me all the time, looking out that window, waiting for Dad. It's a, a wonderful memory. And then uh, on weekends, he'd get off work. Those are really special to us because we got to spend the whole weekend with him, and it was teared up. And uh, I told about how Dad took us out in his four-wheeler, and, and we'd go out riding around in the four-wheeler. At one time, we got stuck, and... <laughs> I didn't know how we were going to get out of the woods. I mean, we were stuck. And my dad was the hero. I mean, he got us out. I mean, this is awesome. We got back home to mom. And, you know, life was pretty good. And, and one day I remember standing in the hallway looking at my dad and mom, and they were talking and no arguing or, or, or anything loud. But my dad put his hands around my mom's waist and he put her on the washer or the dryer, and he said, I'm leaving. And at that point, it was like somebody hit me with a brick because I knew what was going on was true in my heart. And I ran out the front door and I hit up underneath the back seat of my dad's car as far as I could go because there's no way dad's leaving without me. And I, and, uh, I was up in there and, and I was quiet for a little bit and all of a sudden the door opened up and yep, here he is. And then they grabbed me by the feet and the hands and they pulled me out of that car and I'm laying on the ground, kicking and screaming, and my dad got into the car, and the door closed, and he drove out of the driveway and drove out of my life forever. And the worst part about it was standing at the window with my brothers and sisters every day waiting for dad to come home, and he never showed up. But one day, uh, this great big man shows up, and it's my grandpa. And he and my grandma picked my mom and us kids up, and we drove from Michigan to La Crosse, Wisconsin. And my grandpa was my dad. He was awesome. I mean, he wasn't really the big outdoors guy or anything, but he just made us feel special. We were his grandkids. And the interesting thing about my grandpa, there was no welfare. I mean, we lived in a house. They took care of everything. I look back at what they sacrificed for us kids back then. Oh, my. They sacrificed a lot to have us with them. Well. My grandpa, at the age of 12 years old, I found out he had a disease called cancer. And I want you to know, my grandpa being as big and tough as he is, there's nothing going to tear him down. He's here. He's solid. You know, my grandpa kept getting sicker and sicker, and then to the point of losing a lot of weight. And he had what they called a crawling stomach cancer. I remember grandma saying something like that. I didn't know what that was. And I, Next thing you know, grandpa was in the hospital. I went to the hospital to visit him, and he was upbeat and everything, and always happy to see us, but he was hurting, and you could see he was hurting. And, and uh, one day I went there, and my grandpa had passed away, and he was gone. And so, you know, twice in my life, a man that I loved dearly, they were gone, and I had no control over that. And I, and I just, uh, you know, I was down. And I remember being at my grandpa's funeral, riding in the car, just being a little lost, but I still had mom and grandma. And every day I was at home, I started to find out that mom and grandma really couldn't tell me what to do. I was a tough kid, going on 13, 14 years old. I mean, they couldn't tell me what to do. So if I decided to skip school, I was skipping school. I got chewed out a little bit for it or got in a little bit of trouble, big, no big deal. I mean, they couldn't hurt me. Next thing you know, I started hanging around with kids in the streets, and we were uh, partying around all night long, goofing around. I remember driving down the back roads of Onalaska in a, in a convertible Chevy, looking at the speedometer, and we were doing 110 miles an hour. 13, 14-year-old kids, just, just cruising, thinking that's the time of the life. There was a lot of things that went on in my life when I was younger that I look back now that... God didn't have me cross that line, but the line was there to cross. And as things were going, I didn't care about school no more. All I cared about was goofing around with my friends. And uh, one day I got home, and my brothers and sisters were there, and there was a strange man there, and my mom was there, and sat us down and, and uh, told us that we were all going to go to different foster homes. And just like that, we got put into the vehicles, and I got taken out to a farm in Holman, Wisconsin. And uh, my brothers and sisters went to different places, and I didn't get to see them again. 
And the thing about the farm and home in Wisconsin was I, I liked to work and I learned how to work hard, but I absolutely hated living there because there was four other boys that were there and all we did was get up in the morning, milk cows, go to school smelling like a cow and coming home and milking cows. That's all we did. We didn't get to go off for sports. We didn't get to do anything except uh, chores on the farm. And, uh, you know, that was supposed to discipline us, but in reality, it was just a nightmare because I'd go to school, I'd listen to these kids tell about going and hunting and fishing, and I would, uh, man, you just want to stand there and tell lies so you can stick with them just to be a part of the stories. And they'd tell about their dads and their grandpas and all the things they got to do, and, and uh, they'd go home, all I had to do was milk cows and take care of chores. And it was like being in a prison. There was no walls or no, no fences or no barbed wire around uh, that I couldn't climb over, but I couldn't get out of it. I was in a situation that I was put into that I, I didn't put myself into it. It was because I didn't have a father figure. Nobody to tell me, hey, get it done. I was, on, I was off on the streets of my own, but what I did, I hated being on that farm. Every time I had a chance to, I ran away from that farm I would run away and I'd go back down by my friends in La Crosse and I'd go back by my mom. She was the only family I had. And what would happen is I, I really couldn't quite figure it out to begin with, but the police would always figure out where I was at and they'd pick me up. And for truancy, they'd give you three days off of school. Well, those three days for me were spent in jail. They'd pick me up, they'd throw me in jail for three days to teach me a lesson and they'd take me back to the foster home. And I'm gonna tell you something. The coffee and the cornflakes in jail are about as bad as it gets. And that, that is a taste I will never forget. And you know, uh, on the fifth time of running away from the foster home, I went back by my mom and I got caught right away. <clears throat> and I got thrown in jail. And I realized at that point that I had absolutely nobody in life. The only person I had was my felt myself and a bunch of friends on the streets that had their hands wide open. Come on, Ray, we got, we got all kinds of stuff for you to do. We're, we're going to party together. It's going to be great. I didn't want that life. I wanted to be able to go hunting and fishing and doing a few things. And, 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 and I didn't want to go down a bad path. And I remember sitting in jail that night. And I want to tell you, jail is concrete and steel. You kneel down on a concrete floor and you're leaning up against a metal bed. And that's what I did. I was on my knees and I was praying to a God I didn't know. And in my prayer, I asked God to give me somebody in my life that would hold my hand and that would never leave me, no matter what the troubles were, and that would love me for who I am. And I was so heartbroken. And I remember going to bed that night on that steel bed and thinking to myself, okay, tomorrow, when they drive me back to that foster home, as soon as I hit the ground, that door is open. I'm going through the woods and I'm out of there. Nobody's ever going to see me again. And the next morning, I was sitting there waiting for the probation officer to come and pick me up to take me to the foster home. And I was reading a hunting magazine. And in this magazine, there's all kinds of pictures. There's pictures of moose and, and bear and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, to myself, man, is Alaska and Canada and Africa, are they really real? Is there really critters out there like this? And those things are going through my head and the door opens up and a man walks through the door and he sees me sitting there reading that magazine. He said, uh, Ray, he says, uh, come on, we got we to gotta get going. And I am so disheartened because I'm going back to an absolute nightmare. I'm going back to a foster home who nobody cares about me. All I'm going to do is work. On the way back to the home, planning my escape, uh, Tom Polky, his name was, he looked at me and said, Ray, he said, uh, would you like to come hunting with me and my family sometime? I, he said, I, I seen you read that hunting magazine. And here I am, a tough kid. I ain't supposed to be talking to somebody from the sheriff's department or a police officer or probation officer. I'm a tough kid. I turned my head and I said to Tom, I said, yeah, I said, I'd love to go hunting sometime. I wanted to get out of what I was in. I didn't care what it took. I wanted to get out. And... He said to me, he said, I'm going to make a phone call. He says, we're going to come pick you up one of these days and we're going to go hunting. And I believed him. And when I got out of the car that day, I went back to the foster home. I started working and, and doing the exact same routine. But one day, 
there was a phone call. And I want you all to know that Tom Polkey was different than everybody else. Everybody who ever told me they were going to take me hunting and fishing that never showed up, Tom Polkey showed up. And I remember him coming and picking us guys up. <laughs> I was there with him and his three sons, and he picked us up. And I, I uh, went to a, a cabin up in northern, uh, it was uh, Black River Falls. And uh, we were all in the middle of nowhere. All in the middle of nowhere, there was a big pond behind the house and, and the cabin. I mean, this is it. This is what I've been looking at in the magazine. And uh, 4.30 in the morning, the alarm went off. The back door opened up. All those guys, his kids and him, ran out that door, ran off the dock, and jumped into that ice-cold water. Yeah, They're yelling at I'm watching this. I can't hardly believe what's going on. I'm watching this. They say, come on, Ray, come on. It's tradition. you got to jump in here. Oh, no, I ain't jumping in there. That, that water is ice cold, and there's giant fish in there. I ain't want nothing to do with that stuff. And, you know, uh, it wasn't very long. I jumped right in that ice-cold water with them. And what an unbelievable experience because now... I'm a part of a family. I'm a part of something that I dreamed of doing. It changed my life. I remember seeing the first white-tailed deer. You know, we were practicing with bows and getting ready. Back back then, uh, I think a, a hunting license was probably a buck. And, uh, you know, we were practicing with bows and, and, uh, and we were getting ready. We were making little two-on-two -two drives. And here comes this doe. It's coming through the woods for me. And to me, it could have been a 200-class whitetail. I come unglued. I had buck fever so bad that I wanted to jump underneath the brush pile. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that I witnessed seeing a wild animal in the woods with a bow in my hand. This was it. And you know, uh, on the way home, this is probably the most important thing that ever happened to me. Now I had somebody who I trusted, I spent time with and fellowship and, and having a good time in the outdoors. And Tom said to me, he said, Ray, he says, you're going to turn 18 years old. And he says, when you turn 18 years old, you get to have your own family. You can have a job and make your own money, and you can go hunting. Here's a man just told me that, that I trusted. You know something? There was no one more running away from foster homes. I wanted to have my own family. I wanted to make money, and I wanted to go hunting. And you know, I only went hunting with Tom four times during my high school career, but he changed my life. And when I turned 18 years old, it was just like somebody let a cat out of the bag. I'm going to tell you what, the world was mine. You know, because of our military that we have that has made us free and that we can chase our dreams, and I love each and every one of you that have done that for me and your sacrifices, I want to tell you, we can accomplish anything because we're Americans. And that's exactly what happened with me. One month after I turned 18, <laughs> I got married. And, uh, you know... This is awesome. I'm going to school. I got uh, uh, two jobs that I'm working, part-time jobs. And man, I, I mean, things are happening. And I got a bow. I had my own equipment. I started shooting. And you know, one year after I got married, uh, we had a little baby girl. Her name is just like this, this little baby girl. I was so excited. Uh, the story is unbelievable and what happened when she was born. But I was so excited that I got to be a dad. I mean, I got to be a dad. I got to have my own family. And that same year, uh, I was bow hunting, and I harvested my first white-tailed deer. And it was just a doe, but I was so proud of that deer. It was cold out. I took that deer and put it on the back of my car, tied it on her, and I drove around for a week with that deer in the back of my car. <laughs> I mean, everything that Tom Polkey had told me was coming true. And you know, uh, the more and the time went on and uh, uh, things were happening, by the time I was uh, 23 years old, I had five children. I didn't even know what I was doing, but I'm telling you what, I'm working hard, and w one baby after another. And uh, I was working uh, so hard, I, I just couldn't quite make enough money to keep making ends meet, but I was going to do whatever it took to uh, give my kids everything, and I decided to do what my grandpa did. At one time, my grandpa had a shop, and my grandpa did okay with his shop. And my grandpa was a welder, and I really looked up to him. Some of the stories are incredible. So I decided to quit a perfectly good job and go into business for myself because I figured uh, if I can't make it working for somebody else, I'm going to do it on my own. And, uh, you know, that's part of the American dream. 
It's what our military did for us. It's what God's done for us. And I, <laughs> I did. I quit a perfect good job that day. I went out and got a cutting torch and a welding machine, and I started my own business. And I want all of you to know that the fear of failure was probably my biggest drive. I did not want to fail for my family. I did not want to fail for my children. I did not want to have it that they didn't have food on their table. And I worked hard. There was no 40 hours a week. It was 50, 60, 70, 80, whatever it took. And the business started growing. And one day, Tom Polkey shows up at my shop. And he, and he comes over and says, Ray, he says, uh, I want to talk to you about a kid by the name of Brian. And uh, he tells me about Brian, how much trouble he's in. And then he says to me, he says, uh, if, we, uh, if we don't get a, uh, a mentor for Brian or, and, and help him out, he's going to go to St. Mike's. And when he said St. Mike's to me, it really hammered me because my brother Dan went to St. Mike's. And today, yet, my brother Damon is not the same. He went down a totally different path. And uh, that, that, really, that really hit me. The, that night I, I was at home, I think, gosh, the man that changed my life, that did so much for me in my life, uh, thinks that I can mentor another kid? So I called uh, Tom. I said, bring Brian over. He brings Brian over. Here's this little short kid, 14 years old, I looked at Brian and I thought, how in the world could he be in that kind of trouble? And he was in trouble. I get talking to Brian, and here's a great kid, don't have a father in his life. That's his problem, the same problem I had. And I said to him, I said, well, Brian, so if you want to come over after school and clean up uh, at the shop, and maybe we'll do a little hunting and fishing on a weekend if you got time? Oh, yeah, he said, I'd, he said, I'd love that. And you know what? Brian was with me for six years. I saw how that boy's life got changed around just like mine. And you know, when Brian was out of school, I went back to Tom, I need another kid. This went great. Man, let's get another kid over here. And uh, I went through seven other kids, and I found some of them you could lead them to water, but you couldn't make them drink. They were on a different path. But the ones that wanted their life changed around, those kids, you give them the opportunity and I'll tell you what, you cannot believe what these kids accomplished. And you know, all these kids now, they got their own families. They know what it's like to be a, a mom or a dad. I mean, it's pretty awesome to be a part of their life. And they're friends of mine. They're my friends. They're my brothers and sisters. <laughs> and you know, uh, my business kept growing. And things kept happening. And uh, I went from working by myself to having 70 full-time employees. And uh, you know... My wife, Karen, walked up to me one day, just as straight faced as could be, and she said to me, she said, you know, Ray, I came into your life to help save you, and it just about made me snap. Are you kidding me? What are you talking about? I, I, uh, I provide for all the food for you. You have a house. You have cars. You don't need anything. I've done it all for you. And I knew something about Karen that I could never quite figure out. She loved the Lord more than she loved me. And I could never quite figure that out. You know, back when I was a boy, my grandpa used to take all of us guys in a car, take us up to the church, drop us off, and he'd take off. When church was over, he'd come pick us up. And that was the manly thing to do. That's what I thought family was about. And you know, uh, I went to an event in Texas. You see, I was chasing my dreams all over the world with a bowl in my hand by that point. I went to an event in Texas, and a friend of mine by the name of Pat O'Quinn, who was doing the same type of things, I, I, I talked to other hunters that did the same type of things I was doing so that I wouldn't get into a bum hunt. You see, if somebody else had been on a hunt and they give you back a good report on it, then that's a good, good place to go, and that's the way I did it. We, we kind of networked back and forth with a few guys. Well, Pat was one of them. I was at this event, and I want you to know, Pat O'Quinn, he looks like a movie star. When you look at Pat O'Quinn, I mean, he's a movie star. I mean, that's the way he does. I mean, he's just the way he looks and the way he acts. While we're at this event, Karen and Pat are talking and talking and talking. And I'm about ready to snap. You see, I'm turning green. I'm getting a little swolled up. About 45 minutes of it, I walked over to Karen. I had no idea what they were talking about. I walked over to Pat and Karen both. And I'm looking at them, I could about imagine what they saw in my eyes, and I said, what in the world's going on here? 
And both of them turned and looked at me at the same time and said, we're talking about your salvation. I said, what? And you know, that really hit me. It turned me from one side to the other. And I, you know, I knew how to grab a hold of Pat by the collar and say, stay away from my wife. I didn't know how to handle what was just given to me. I shook my head and walked away. You know, during the week, uh, Pat called me. Uh, Pat, he called me. He says, <laughs> Ray, I want to talk to you for a minute. And he says, uh, I want to talk to you about what happened and what Karen and I were talking about. And he says, I want to talk to you about having your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when he said that, I want all of you to know that I never heard anything like that in my life. I can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything else Pat said to me for the next half hour to 45 minutes on the phone went in one ear and out the other, but that stuck with me. And you know, uh, it was the following weekend, Karen and I went to church. I used to go to church with Karen. She has a voice like an angel. I'd love sitting next to her, uh, listen to her sing. And that was really family, was just going to church and being a part of it, sitting there. And uh, I was sitting in church, and it was Father's Day. And I started thinking about all the things that went on with my dad and the man that I had become. And you know something? Not that I was proud or anything, but I wasn't such a bad guy. Everything that happened in my life wasn't so, so bad now. I had my own family. I made a lot of money, and I got to chase my dreams all over the world with a bull. And I was thinking about that. Gosh, if maybe things wouldn't have happened the way they did, I wouldn't be who I am. And I was sitting in church, and I forgave my dad for everything that he did to my brothers and sisters and me. You see, uh, I hated the way I looked because I looked like my dad. I absolutely hated my dad because other kids got to be his kids, and he had another family. I didn't want nothing to do with my dad. But that day, I forgave him, and it was like a weight came off of me like you can't believe. And in forgiveness, I started crying uncontrollably in church next to my wife. She said, what's, what's the matter, Ray? I said, well, I forgave my dad. And you know, uh, <clears throat> as things were going, I was always doing shooting demonstrations. And if any of you have followed some of the things that have gone on, I, I was always uh, taking high poundage bows and shooting things at long range. And uh, we did videos and stuff where I was shooting pop cans and 35 millimeter film canisters at 100 yards with those bows. And a lot of times when they opened up a new Gander Mountain store, they would say, Ray, we want you to come over and shoot the ribbon with an arrow instead of cutting it with the scissors. Well, I want you to know that that kind of pressure on a guy to have three to 600 people standing behind you, you don't want to miss. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's kind of funny. You find out what kind of man you are when you got to grab the second arrow out of your quiver, I'll tell you that. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> so I, I practiced all the time at long range to make to make me my a good short <clears throat> uh, to make me good at short range. And I think because of my dreams of wanting to harvest an animal and not miss, I think the fear of failure that made me a perfectionist in shooting archery. And uh, so the one day I put five ribbons across the, this metal bars, I went all the way back and I'm standing there and the arrows are dropping out of the sky and they are cutting the ribbon at, at an unbelievable distance. They're dropping out and I'm cutting the ribbon. I cut five ribbons in a row. I'm standing there with my mouth wide open. I cannot believe what I just witnessed happen with my bow and myself. I think, man, how in the world can anybody be that accurate? And I want you to know I'm not being vain or bold. I'm telling you, this is, this is pretty awe. And uh, I walked up to that target I'm going to get my arrows off. I got more confidence than you can shake a stick at because on Saturday, I'm going to be standing in front of a whole pile of people, and I'm only going to be standing at 20 yards. And, you know, uh, at 20 yards, it's going to be a chip shot. So I'm walking up there, and I'm pulling those arrows out of the target, and I'm thinking to myself, how in the world could a man go back 100 yards and cut ribbons? That's inhumanly impossible. And I got to the last arrow... And as I was pulling it out, what Pat Quinn said to me about having my own personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and I realized it is inhumanly impossible to be that accurate, and that God had been guiding my arrows since I was five years old. Everything that happened to me since I was five years old happened for a purpose. And I can't deny it. I've always been true to myself. 
I pulled that arrow out. I'm having the best day of my life shooting. I'm going to go shoot some more. I started walking back to where I was going to shoot. I got about halfway back. And I'm going to tell you what, the Holy Spirit, it was so overwhelming. It was like somebody hit me in the back of the head with a club. <laughs> I went to my knees and with a bow in one hand and my arrows in the other. See, those were one of my gods. I raised them up. I said, from now on, Lord, this is no longer to my glory. It's to yours. I, I in that moment, I, in that moment, became reborn again. There was things that happened in the next minute that were just amazing. I had more wisdom come into my head than I've ever had in my life. I realized I've only got this much time left on earth. See, a lot of my friends were either in accidents or they're dying of cancer or something bad has happened to them. They're all done. They're gone. When is it my turn? Is it five minutes from now? Is it a year from now? I've only got so much time left. And then I started thinking about all the things that I was doing. I started thinking about my business and the, the trophy room and the, and the power lifting that I was doing. And I realized that my trophy room is probably three times as big as this sanctuary and quite a bit higher. And it's completely filled with animals that I chase with a bull. I realized that the day I died, every one of those animals were going to be on somebody else's wall and my name wasn't even going to be on them. So what did I accomplish there? Nothing. All the money I had in the bank, you know, with the assets and everything that I, that I had accomplished, uh, I was worth millions. All the money I had in the bank, people were fighting over it, and I wasn't even dead yet. And uh, <laughs> the sport of powerlifting, because of not going out for sports in school, I was driven. I was very, very competitive. Uh, after 10 years of the sport of powerlifting, I'd win first place once in a while. After 20 years of being drug-free and powerlifting, I was setting uh, national and world records and, and beyond that I mean there was no touch in me and what I was accomplishing because I was that driven that was my stress reliever this is what I did uh, and uh, it was a dream of mine since I was a boy and at that moment I thought to myself somebody that had a little better day than I had and worked at it just as hard and a little better technique was going to break my records so what did I really accomplish in, in, my, in the sport of powerlifting absolutely nothing for myself as in everything, it was nothing for myself. And you know, I got up from my knees and I knew exactly what I had to do. I just made a promise. I just was reborn again. And I walked up to my wife, Karen, and I said to her, I said, Karen, I gave my heart to the Lord. And she's standing there looking at me. And I said to her, I said, I know what my calling is. I said, I'm going to help as many kids as I can while I'm still on this earth because I've only got so much time. I don't have time to go back to my business and work. I don't have time to power lift, and I don't have the time to chase critters all over the world with a bull. I'm walking away from that today, right now. And she's looking at me, and you know what she said to me? She said, Ray, you do what you think is best, and I'm sticking with you. Now, here's a man that just walked up to his wife, and could be completely off his rocker into the left field. And she says, you, think, you do what you think is best, and I'm sticking with you. Well, I want you to know that from that moment forward, I thought things were going to be smooth. I thought everything was going <laughs> was to fall into place. And as, as driven as I was, I thought... There's going to be thousands and thousands of camps and we're going to do all this stuff and it's all going to work out just smooth. Well, I want you to know, Lord had to teach me a few things. And the thing he had to teach me the most was to be on my knees and stay focused on him. Because it's God who started this ministry. The ministry of Kicking Bear is the Lord's ministry. It is not mine. If I try to do things on my own, it is going to fail. And what I've witnessed with the ministry of Kicking Bear is so awesome. I mean, there's camps all over the United States. We're in 21 states now. But I get to be with other believers who come together for the same purpose, to do the Lord's work. You see, I talked about Paul and all the shipwrecks and everything that goes on between one spot to the next. That's exactly what happens with Kicking Bear. But when I get to come to Baraboo, Wisconsin, 
and be around other believers, men who are there for others, not for themselves, and not using Christ for their own gain, but using them to do the Lord's work. I mean, it's awesome. I mean, the other night we were standing in front of a fire and all these people were in front of a fire. A message was given and then an altar call. And we said, anybody that's given their heart to the Lord tonight, uh, we have uh, some salvation poem cards given out. There was three people handing those cards out and we were handing out cards, we were handing out cards. There was decisions for Christ that night. You see, God has brought his chosen forward. And as believers doing the Lord's work, uh, we get to witness these miracles. And I mean, it, I sat there the other night again in just total tears as I am today. I want all of you to know that if the Lord calls you to a ministry, run. Drop everything, become an unnetted believer, and run toward it. The pure joy in your life doing the Lord's work, there is no comparison in earthly stuff whatsoever. I want you to know that. He says in the scriptures, he is going to provide for us like the birds and the flowers in the field. I want to, <laughs> there are so many people come up, Ray, how do you, uh, how do you finance Kicking Bear? Who does this for you? Who does that? That's a man. <laughs> I really don't know the Lord has provided for us. And that's the absolute truth. How can you go and put on a camp like what we did and have hundreds of people come to a camp and not one person pay a dime? It kind of sounds like a few loaves of bread and a few fish, don't it? I mean, it's amazing. It's a miracle. You know, this camp started out around 80 to 100 kids. And as the Lord grows the camp, you know, there's camps right now that are 1,500 kids that come to the camp. How do you provide a camp that is at no cost? The Lord does that. This is his ministry. And I want to tell you a miracle that happened in my life that is so eye-opening to me. Remember when I told you when I was 14 years old, sitting in a jail cell, kneeling on concrete, leaning up against steel? had nobody in my life, and I asked God to give somebody in my life that would stick with me no matter what, no matter how bad it gets. I want you to know that he brought his daughter. I married the king's daughter, Karen. And no matter what, how, how, how bad the storms have been, she has always stuck by me. And she has never run. She's always there holding my hand. Yep, Ray, we can do it. Yep, let God handle it. Ray, don't, don't do it on your own. Pray about it. It'll work out. God has blessed me. I'm still 14 years old. He has blessed me with something I would have never, never, never thought that I would have in my life. We have a family. We've got lots of grandchildren, and we tear it up. <laughs> it's awesome. So... I'll leave this with you. In giving my heart to the Lord, there's a few things that I learned. One of them was uh, to have Bible studies with my family, and most of all with my wife. If you want to protect your families, you've got to put God in the middle of them. I loved my wife more than anything in the world when I married her, and it was a great love. And I, told, I even wrote a story about how much I loved her in climbing a mountain. And you see that peak, that's as, that's as high as your love is going to get. Well, when you get to that peak, there's another one. Then there's another one. I want to tell you what, my love kept growing for my wife. But in doing Bible studies with her and being able to uh, share with her, all these little arguments that go on in a family are, are disappearing. And you're together on things. And all of a sudden... Your marriage turns around to a marriage of joy. And I want you to know that God has protected my eyes as a man, and we're all men that are here. And he's made my wife, and she's beautiful, but she, he has made my wife the prettiest woman I have ever seen on the face of the earth. There is nobody compares to her. Okay. Uh, I'm going to come get you. 
Hi, everybody. I wanted you to know that I don't normally dress like this either for church, but he said if he's going to dress down, I'm going to dress down. So this is how we, uh, how we look for kicking bear. And uh, thank you for allowing us to be here with you today. Yeah, awesome. I want you to know that there truly is a spiritual battle out there, and we're in the middle of it. But doing the Lord's work, being together with other believers that have your back, being involved with Bible studies with other men. You know, at one time I thought going into a Bible study was a little different. I want to tell you what, the toughest men I know love the Lord. And those men that have your back, that ask for nothing other than to pray for you and to stand alongside you, you'll never find that in business. You'll never find it anywhere but in the love for the Lord. So I just want to witness to you that this is real. 14 years old, he blessed me with everything I, I could imagine. And in giving my heart to the Lord, he has blessed me with a joy that I cannot compare. And he's given me a, a, a heavenly marriage. And he's given me children and grandchildren. You know, and I'll leave you with this. Four weeks ago, we had a grandchild that was born, little Oliver. And five minutes of him being born, he passed away. And how do you, as a man, handle something like that? And I'm holding my little Oliver in my arms. And I'm able to tell my grandchildren, we're going to be with Oliver again today because he is in heaven. And to have that kind of joy in my heart, I want you to know, as a believer, I can't wait to go home to the Lord because this sickness and death and sin in this world is terrible. But we're here to do one thing, and that's to do the Lord's work. All the rest of it means nothing. It's meaningless and chasing the wind. So I'll bring Pastor Dave up. I probably ran too far over. Thank you. Would you stand for this, please? I just want to make sure you understand what Ray and Karen have, okay, is Jesus, okay? So if you didn't sense the love of Jesus, if you didn't sense the presence of Jesus, uh, golly, I don't know. What we want you to know is Jesus wants you to. What you see in their lives is what we call the fruit of righteousness, Okay? And God works different ways in everybody's life. He created us all different. He given us all different gifts. Uh, but what is consistent is he calls us and he asks us to be his children. And we need to respond. Okay? Just like Ray did, like he explained to us. And then we wait and we see what God does in our lives when we give him all of who we are. Okay? And that lies on us lies on us. I'm going to ask you, and I want those of you in 180, if you're standing, would you please stand too? And I'm going to ask everybody in here just to raise your hand and let's, let's ask God's blessing on Kicking Bear Ministries and Ray and Karen. Let's do that. Could we please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this family, Lord. It's an extended family. Uh, but Lord, we pray for the ministries that you have given them. And Lord, I pray that as you have blessed them, you would continue to bless them, Lord, so that your work can be accomplished. Lord, I pray that you would keep Ray's heart humble before you so that you can work through him. I pray that you would protect them. Lord, I pray that you would allow him to have all of these events and protect those events. I pray that uh, kids would not be hurt. And I pray that you would uh, protect them in ways, Lord, we can't even begin to think. And I pray, Lord, particularly that your word would go forth with power from his lips and that hearts would be one to you and people would give their lives to you and begin to taste the sweetness of a personal relationship with the Son of God. And we would enter into that relationship with you that will carry us not just through this world, but on into the next. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. God bless you. Thank you. I would think of you.